mom kept it pretty secretive as to the hard times, but the hard times were more a result of not having maybe what some of the other kids did. Like a few of the families had cars, some of them had telephones, eventually they would get television. Like we never got a television until, no, we never got a television when I was, until, I don't think they ever bought a television, to be honest with you. Uh, we didn't get a phone until I was in high school. This Maui native who struggled as a student in his early years would go on to win Hawaii teaching honors. Retired public school chemistry teacher Ed Kinoza, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ed Ginoza didn't realize he could be a good student until a teacher encouraged him. He became a teacher who in turn encouraged many students to excel, introducing them to the world of science. For nearly three decades, Ed Ginoza of Kihei taught chemistry, math, and physics at Maui High School. Many of his students have gone on to study science at top colleges, including MIT, Yale, and Stanford, and they've had successful careers in the field. And Ginoza says it was important to treat everyone equally because he knew what it was like to feel less than as an Okinawan kid growing up on a plantation in West Maui. I was born in Pukuli. It's a little plantation village. I wouldn't say a little, little, but it was Actually, one time it was quite a large village. Um, and we had six children, three boys, three girls. I was the fourth of the six. Um, and dad was an irrigator, and that's all I knew him as, an irrigator. Um, my mother, um, she was a housewife, pretty much. Uh, and uh, so finances were real tough. We never got a car until after I left. So did it feel like you were being, getting short shrift or, because some, sometimes people learn they have abundance even when the money is low. And sometimes it just seems really hard. Um, it wasn't, I don't think we felt that deprived because most of us were pretty much in the same situation. We, uh, I mean, you're in a plantation and all the kids are almost in the same situation. Some people are worse off than others. Well, what was it like, small kid times uh, on the plantation? Uh, Talked about the, how the family had trouble, you know, with hard times. What, what else? You know, grammar school up to the fourth grade was okay. Fifth and sixth grade was kind of bad. I've already said that. Seventh grade was bad. Eighth grade was okay. But um, actually living in a community in some ways was good because, you know, we were all pretty much friends. But um, being Okinawan had some drawbacks, made you feel a little bit insecure. Weren't there a lot of Okinawans on the plantation? Not where we lived at. There were just three families of Okinawans. Oh, and what was everybody else? From all over the place. They were considered Japanese. We were considered Okinawans. And, and you're always very conscious of that? I've always been conscious of that. And uh, with ourselves, we weren't treated badly, but my sister was. She suffered some prejudice. Oh, how so? Because we're different. They teased her? No, I really don't remember what, you know, my, exactly what she went through, but I remember my mother or my sister saying, yeah, she had some prejudice against her by certain individuals. So it was pretty much of a normal life as far as growing up. We went to the Methodist church and uh, we were part of a youth group, so all our friends were there, but it was uh, a segregated place. I mean, Japanese camp, Filipino camp, the Portuguese, and the segregation a lot of times came out in fights with the kids because I remember some of my friends would fight with the Portuguese kids. Mm -hmm. Because the Portuguese kids' parents were the Lunas and right, they were administering. Right. And I don't, I don't know why, but it was just, you know, yeah. But... Oh yeah, with kids stuff, it could be anything. It doesn't yeah, have to have a yeah, reason, right, right? right? And there would be fights with some of the Hawaiian kids. And, um, but prejudice was kind of widespread at that point. And you were a, a, a small minority 
if there are only three families who are Okinawan. Now, what would be the discrimination against Okinawans? In Pukuli, we didn't, the boys didn't suffer that, but I know that on Oahu, actually, it was worse, where people would get divorced if they married an Okinawan. And that was because Okinawans were uh, from we're, the country folk? The, the Japanese were really almost, you know, their their uh, culture is a very homogeneous type of culture. Yeah. Right? They don't approve of Koreans. They don't, you know, even so the, the base, great baseball player, he was Korean actually. But they're very prejudiced against outsiders. They call them gaijin. And uh, oh, hakujin, they call them, foreigners, they refer to them. Um, but we never, growing up, I never really felt that with most of my friends, with my friends anyway. But I remember my dad had you know, some feeling about Filipinos. You know, my sister was thinking about going out to the Filipino boy, you know, they objected. Which was always very fascinating because um, I have a Portuguese uncle. And, you know, he seemed to be all right. <laughs> After high school, Ed Ginoza went to college in Colorado, where he graduated with a degree in chemistry and later earned a master's in education. Ginoza says his parents initially balked at sending him to college, but ended up sacrificing to make it happen. Fortunately, dad and mom had an endowment insurance policy for about $1,800. The endowment policy doesn't exist anymore. They made it illegal but they would get a cash payout after, you know, 20 years or something like that. And they finally agreed to send me to college with that endowment. I look back now and I think, wow, they spent their entire life savings to send me to college. That's amazing. Where did you go? I went to a small school in Colorado, uh, Adams State College. Did you know you wanted to go into science when you started in college? Actually, I was, I wanted to go into engineering. Um, don't ask me how I knew about engineering, but I said, okay, you know, I like math, I like science, so I wanted to go into engineering. So I went there with the idea of taking the pre-engineering course and then found out that after a year, they offered me, you know, national defense loan. At that time, we had this NDA loan, which was 3% uh, interest. And so, well, they offered that to me, and then my chemistry teacher said, why don't you just stay here? and major in chemistry, physics, and math instead of going to engineering school. And so what was the, what did, what did you get offered? It was a scholarship or a loan? I had a scholarship for the first quarter, which paid my in-state tuition. Then during the third quarter, I was walking down the aisle and the dean of the college, you know, a small school, so he asked me how things were. He said, oh, it's going pretty good. I think I'm gonna get a 4.0 grade point average this quarter while working full-time in a Chinese restaurant. Oh, you didn't mention the full time in a Chinese restaurant. Yeah, yeah, I worked, well, pretty close to full time. I would go in at four o'clock and I wouldn't get back until 10 o'clock. And uh, so I reduced one course, I carried 12 credits and then did that. And so the dean said, you know, if you want to go to summer school, I've got this money that you can have. So I talked to my parents and my parents said, go ahead. and. Uh, the loan actually covered my tuition, my books, and living expenses. Because you did well in, in your early days in college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the, socially, what was it like? Socially, it was different. <laughs> uh, it's, there weren't too many Hawaii kids there. In fact, when I got there, I think just three of us. Yeah, socially, it was a little difficult because we were different. You know, and, and it wasn't confusing to people because you're a Japanese guy working in a right. Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> when did you decide you're going to be a teacher? After I graduated, yeah, I decided by then I had most of the credits for, you know, for um, to be a teacher. So I just needed like student teaching. So I said, okay, maybe I'll just complete that part. Now I've heard that you were actually offered a couple of jobs teaching, but you wouldn't take them, even though you're unemployed, because you felt strongly you wanted to work at a public school. Yeah, that was after I came back. Um, I walked, 
I went to Baldwin, and we have what they call vice positions, which is a one-year, um, you know, just you're only obligated for one year. And after 1972, all of us who were probationary teachers were released. Um, so a friend of mine and I, Peter Martin, he's now a big developer on Maui, were up at USIU, which is United States International University. And so I, we were at the site taking a class and uh, the head of USIU asked me if I ever considered working with the university because they were trying an experimental school where they're taking high school sophomores. Kids after their sophomore year, they're trying to put them in the university. And I also met Dr. Melrose, his wife, who was the head of Seabury. And she asked me if I would consider working at Seabury. But I decided that wasn't the route for me. I wanted to go back to the public school. Why? I've always been a strong believer in the public school. I've always felt that, you know, public schools is where I grew up, and I felt that, you know, we need teachers in public schools just as much as anybody, any place else. And I, I just, I guess, felt there were certain other benefits that I like about teaching in the public school and working for the state. One was I knew the retirement system was much better, but at that time, I think, I don't know why, I just felt like, okay, I'm going back to public school. After one year at Baldwin High School, Ginoza was hired as chemistry teacher at Maui High School, where he would work for the rest of his career and pick up awards for his teaching. Ginoza firmly believes that being a great educator means helping students in the classroom and beyond. Teaching is really almost a creative art that most people don't realize. You can't just throw a subject matter at kids. You can't just stand in front of a class and expect them to love you or whatever. You have to have, you know, experiences and you need stories and... So you, you need to build a bond you need, and, you and storytelling is a bond, Right, right. And it's a bond and it's a trust, trust issue. Uh, you need to get a trust of the kids, but you have to develop a relationship with the kids. And this is where I say that most of the relationships I develop, or a lot of it was after school hours. Like in the 70s, I would take the kids and start the science club and would take the kids hiking all over the island. We actually even went to the big island one year. And we would always go through the Haleakala Crater. And what the kids remember is those trips that we took. So you just you, you bonded over activities and uh, that had to do with and classes and yeah. classes too because I would keep my room open, so the kids would eat lunch there and they would play chess or they would ask for homework help, and I actually had classes like on Tuesday nights when I was teaching AP, so the kids would come. But it was also very social. That was that means a, a lot from you taking time off from. Your, your days off and taking them to do things, having classes open yeah, it was. when other teachers might have had some quiet time? Yeah, most teachers went into the lunchroom or have quiet time, but I found out, hey, you know, kids need help, I'll be there. I gave up my prep period every day after school to work with the kids, which meant that I would have to do my prep at night, so it was always 10 o'clock at night before I'd quit, and weekends I would be working on their papers. But I also did certain things I think that were really powerful. And one of the things I did early on was when kids took exams, I would always have the results for them the next day, even when I went on a trip. Um, during the time of mainstreaming, you had a, a science class and one of your, your students was blind. Yes. I got him when he was a freshman. And I was really very reluctant because I had to completely change the way I taught the course. Um, and maybe it was good because now I had to prepare everything three weeks in advance. Oh, preparation again. Yeah, it was. It was, and it forced me to prepare three weeks in advance because any written material would have to be first brailed. And, um, and I told you about, you know, the 
how his previous teacher had treated him. How was that? She would explain something and then point to the board, not realizing that he was blind. And uh, she had no regard for how he felt. And he was kind of quiet, but that happens a lot with kids. You know, they, even if they don't understand, they remain quiet. But then later on, it would come up. And so I made sure that everything I said was not only on the board, but I had to verbally give instructions. I had to verbally explain how to do things that would normally require, um, easiest way to do it is put it on the board. But for example, I remember trying to teach him what they call dimension analysis. Uh, and dimension analysis is nothing more than doing conversions either from centimeters to millimeters to inches or cups to quarts to gallons. But I had a specific way that I wanted them to do the work. And uh, at first he had a little difficulty, but the instruction finally took hold because one day he said he was on the bus going home and he said, I understand how it's done. Then when he graduated, he came to see me and said, Mr. Ginoza, thank you very much. He said, you made science crystal clear. I could actually see the universe. The achievements of Ed Ginoza, students in science, caught the attention of recruiters from the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology. 1971, 72, when I first had my first student going to MIT, uh, there are very few people that were going into MIT and I just so happened to get the recruiter who was the past president of the MIT foundation that run, ran the place. And he told me, he said, what we did at Maui High was very, very unusual because at that time they didn't look at it, uh, applicants from Hawaii as, you know, like a primary recruiting area. And um, but Maui High stuck out on the list? Maui High stuck out on the list to the point where my principal came back and said, uh, one of my principals said, people in Oahu were talking about how we had the uh, key to the back door at MIT because we started putting kids in on a regular basis. You said your kids nominated you for Teacher of the Year in 1988, which you won. Um, what did they say about you? Did they say, whoa, he's really rough, but he'll give you a fair shake. Yeah, interesting, because yeah, I, got, I was considered as a real tough teacher, but apparently, you know, the impact that I had on them was, uh, was interesting. I, I wish I had brought my little book with me that one year after I got that, then the kids had a luncheon in Coho's, a restaurant downtown, and they invited me, and all the kids were there, and they presented me with a thank you book. Um, why did you win Teacher of the Year? What was it? Actually, the kids recommended me. I mean, my students, it was actually students that decided what teacher they're going to put up for Teacher of the Year. And actually, I got it, I got put in twice. In 87, I was, went for district, I didn't get picked. Then in 80, actually 87, I got picked. 86, I didn't get picked. But I found out why I didn't get it in 86, because my essay was a little bit too negative. About what? <laughs> about the DOE, perhaps? Yeah, it was about the DOE. <laughs> and I said that it's unfair for kids to be leaving all these classes because of student activities. So when I got uh, picked again in 87, then I decided, okay, that didn't blow over too well, so I wrote another essay on a more positive side. <laughs> a little political adventure political, there. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's how you approach, you know, what I learned from that first experience that you don't be negative. Can you tell when you're helping a kid that this is going to mean something to them, or is it not clear at the time whether it's taking some, sometimes? That's the interesting part. You can tell not by what they say, because a lot of times the kids will look at you and say, yeah, yeah, I understand, but it's not, you know if it's not taking hold. 
I know when it's not taken hold, so I have to take a different approach to it. So at some point, can you see a little light bulb go off? I mean, oh, can yes. you actually see oh, that? Oh, yes. Um, you've had some students go on to some terrific science positions. Would, would, can you recall any of them for me right now? Yeah, the one I remember was, the one that was always fascinated me was, um, I had this girl when she was a junior and senior, and I had taught her, again, dementia analysis, which was a very powerful tool in teaching physics and chemistry. And she went on to university. She wasn't, too comf she wasn't very confident that she could handle engineering. But she said, she wrote back to me and she said, I went to the university, I took chemistry, and I maxed the first exam. And then she said, um, from there, she went on to Stanford for her master's in electrical engineering, and she wrote to me from Intel. Ed Ginoza retired in the year 2000, but he continues to share his passion with students. As a Hawaii Science Bowl coach, Ginoza mentors Maui High School students who are vigorous contenders and high performers at the competitions. So it's a really, uh, I mean, there's so much time and effort put into that. What does it mean to the students who participate? Um, for them to participate, and the ones who really take it seriously, it really builds their backgrounds. It really solidifies their background. And the one thing sometimes that I don't mention is that um, I actually have them doing the teaching. They teach themselves? No. You know, when you teach the kids, some kids are going to progress much faster than others, right? And like right now, I've got a procedure where if a kid, one kid is answering all the questions, and I hand him the questions, and he runs the session. And you can see that, I can see like, for example, I have one kid doing it right now, and he's using the techniques that I taught him. So they become the teacher. And the interesting part is these kids come back and they love to teach. They all, the graduates a lot of times will come back and help me with the math or whatever. Like I have kids from MIT coming back and actually doing the teaching. They will teach them some advanced stuff. You're not getting paid for it, right? And, the, yeah, and, and uh, it's not part of school credit, so everybody's, it's a labor of love, but it's also very hard to make it happen. Yeah, and we're having actually our 25th anniversary. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, we look at reward by monetary means, but I felt that there's things that I did that money can't buy um, because of the success of the kids. I mean, you can't buy that type of gratification that you get. Money doesn't you know, yeah, it would be nice to get paid. People always ask me, why do you do it? You're not getting paid for that? And, you know, it's, it's not, everything's not about money. I mean, financially, I guess I'm set, so it's not a problem, too. Yeah. But have you ever, being a math guy, have you ever co computed how many hours you spent training Science Bowl competitors? I have. <laughs> okay, so what's the deal? How much money would you have made if you got paid? I have never figured out how much money I would <laughs> but how many paid. So how many hours? Uh, well, you can figure at least two hours every day, uh, minimum, and not counting prep time, uh, vacations. We go summer, we go Christmas vacation, we go Easter breaks. Um, I don't know, maybe five, six hundred hours, maybe more. Um, 20 something years of doing that. I mean 500 per, not 500 per year. Oh yes, per 500, year. 500, 600 per year times Pretty, pretty decades. close to that, yeah. Times decades, maybe not quite 500. Uh, yeah, I would say maybe 400. Wow, and it was worth it. It's all been worth it. It's all been worth it. What about when Punahou beats you? Uh, not too happy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you beat Kalani, my alma mater. <laughs> well, we beat Kalani, we beat Punahou, we beat Yolani, yeah. Yolani's not too happy when we beat them. And since 2002, we've taken six science polls, so 
you can figure that we've probably won as many as the private schools, you know, any private school. Makes you feel good to say that, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Ed Ginoza met his wife in a college physics class. They raised two daughters. And at the time of our conversation in 2016, they'd been married for 51 years. Mahalo to Ed Ginoza of Kihei Maui for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha, ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. There must be something about having taught in a, in, on an island for so many years and then you see not only your students, but your students' kids and their kids, and <laughs> relatives. I mean, what's that like? Uh, I, think, I think there's, I found to be actually kind of nice. Um, I had an optometrist and uh, he gave me a free pair of glasses. He forgot, lost the pill. <laughs> uh, sometimes I see one of the students I had uh, in high school, which I was, was very close to, and she's a pharmacist at Kaiser. And so it's, it's kind of nice in a way because when you do a good job, the kids also respond in a like manner.